We are moving to our second talk of the day by Onya Byrne from the University College Dublin. And we are changing a bit our subject from fluid dynamics to computational neuroscience. Onya, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It's a pleasure to have you here. Can you please start sharing your screen and starting your talk whenever you are okay with that? Thank you. Perfect. We can thank see your you screen, that's all fine. Introduction, so can you see my slides now? Yes, yes, yes all fine. we do. Perfect. Okay, so thank you very much for the kind introduction and for inviting me to speak at um, this wonderful workshop. So today I'm gonna to talk to you about mathematical neuroscience. So something maybe a little different to what um, you're used to. Um, I'll begin with an overview of the field, talk about the types of things that people work on in mathematical neuroscience. Um, and then I'm gonna talk in a little more detail about some of the work that I've been doing. Okay, so to begin, um, I have a bit of an introduction um, or motivation into you know, why would we want to use maths to study the brain? Well, the brain is a complex system. It's um, made up of around 100 billion interconnected neurons and each neuron can just be viewed as an oscillator. So really the brain is just a large network of coupled oscillators. And in the brain, damage to this network of coupled oscillators can lead to neurological problems. But because there's so many neurons, so many oscillators, it's possible for the brain to relearn how to do things, how to learn, learn how to do different tasks using a different set of neurons. But this kind of mechanism of self-learning and retraining isn't well understood. Um, Whereas if we understood that, we could then develop treatments for these diseases and try to trigger your brain to relearn how to do different tasks and how to repair damaged circuits. So an example of this would be in Parkinson's disease where um, patients have damage to parts of their brain and the symptoms are movement related. So you end up having tremors, so you're shaking a lot and freezing. So you um, try to move, but you can't move. And neurologically, this would be seen um, as excessive synchronization in certain parts of the brain. So if you're to measure the activity, that part of the brain, you'll see that all the neurons are doing the same thing at the same time. When really we want them to be doing different things, so processing different pieces of information. <laughs> A treatment for Parkinson's disease is deep brain stimulation, where they put an electrode into a certain part of your brain, so the part that's affected, and then that's connected to kind of a battery or um, almost like a pacemaker, and you can send signals to that part of the brain that break up the excessive synchronization, and that allows the person to move around freely and they no longer have this shaking or um, freezing. So I was going to show you a quick video of a patient who has this um, deep brain stimulation um, active um, and show you the, um, how they're getting on. So on the left, you'll see um, a video of the patient before, um, or so when the deep brain stimulation is turned off. So you can turn it on and off. And then on the right, there will be a video of him with it turned on. So I'll play that. And with your index finger to your nose, back to me, okay. and to your nose, do the best and back to me. Good. Now, with both hands at the same time, can you tap your thumb and your index finger as wide open and fast as you can? Yeah, pretty tough. Can you, with both hands, can you open and close? This one does it better than this one. Are you able to do that? Okay. Now, with both hands open and closed. Hold your hands out in front of you. Tap you do your toe. other leg. This is another one. That's okay. That's okay. You're doing good? Okay. Great job. And ready for me to get it back foot? on? Okay. Be right here. Thank you. 
Okay, so I'll just pause it there and uh, head back over to the slides. So you can see that this treatment is really effective. Those two videos were taken on the same day, one with the device turned on and one with the device turned off. So the patient is able to go about their daily business when it's turned on, when it's off, they're extremely dehabilitated. But the problem with this treatment is that the reason for how or why it works is poorly understood. So um, it's difficult to calibrate the device. So when you implant this electrode into a um, into an in patient, you have to spend months and months on end trying to get the correct settings. So are they, um, you need to change the kind of strength of the signal, how frequent the signals are, and things like that. But if we're to understand the process of how it works, so under, to um, study the properties of synchronization within this network of neurons, then perhaps we'd be able to calibrate this system more effectively. Okay, so that's kind of motivation of how we might use maths to study the brain, which um, allows me to kind of get to the, the rest of the talk. So hopefully I've motivated you on why we might want to study um, the brain using maths. Um, I'll begin, I'll continue the rest of the talk um, by starting with an overview of the underlying biology that you'll need to follow the talk. Don't worry, not too much of it, and it's through the eyes of a mathemat mathematician slash physicist um, like myself. Then I'll review some of the um, historical um, models used in this field. Then we'll look at the um, this next generation neural model that um, I've been developing in um, my work. And then finally, I'll discuss some applications. Okay. I've just noticed um, there's kind of things popping up in the chat, so I'll just make sure there's no questions. Okay, so that's fine. Okay, so um, as I've said, the brain is made up of cells known as neurons. So this here is a sketch of um, what they look like that was made by Cajal in 1900. There, and there's a couple of cells here. So the dark spots are the cell bodies. So that's kind of the interior of your neuron. And then we have all of these stems um, attached to that cell body. So the sets, um, stem that's projecting up from a cell is the axon, and that's the outward um, channel for our neuron. So messages are sent from the cell body up the axon to other cells in the network. And then the roots coming out the bottom are known as the dendrites. So these connect to other neurons and pick up messages. So these are the incoming um, channels. And so I said cells send messages. What do I mean by that? Well, the brain is just an electrical circuit and neurons release bursts of electrical activity known as action potentials. And that's how they send messages. So it releases a burst of electrical activity that travels down the axon and then it meets the dendrite of another neuron at a synapse. So this is the connection between the two cells. And at this synapse, the action potential, so that burst of electrical activity, releases a neurotransmitter, which opens and closes these kind of passages between the two cells. So when that electrical activity comes in, these passages, which are known as ion channels, open. And as the name suggests, an ion channel is a channel in which ions can travel through. So the ion channels, they look like this, and we have lots of different ions. Ions are charged particles. So if an ion is moving in and into a cell, and that's a positively charged ion, then the voltage inside your cell is going to increase. If the ion is a negatively charged ion, then the voltage is going to decrease. So by opening up these ion channels, 
we see changes in the voltage of our neurons. And if a neuron's voltage is increased sufficiently, then it releases an action potential. And the cycle starts all over again. So it sends an action potential to another cell. There's ion channels opening and closing. Voltages change and perhaps then it releases an action potential. So they're the kind of key ideas of neural processing. And with that idea, Hodgkin and Huxley were able to develop a mathematical model to describe how an action potential um, is propagated or is um, initiated inside a cell. So they were able to see that a neuron is just an electrical system and it therefore can be re represented using a standard electrical circuit diagram. So here on the left, we have electro electrical circuit diagram to describe our neuron. We have the voltage inside the cell at the bottom, the voltage outside at the top. And then each of our ion channels acts like a battery. It's just a pump, it's pumping in ions. Um, and if they're positively charged ions, then that's going to lead, to lead to an increase in voltage. If they're negatively charged ions, it's going to lead to a decrease in voltage. And the channels have some um, conductance associated with them. So we have a resistor corresponding to that um, conductance. So they developed a set of equations just using the laws of electrical circuits, so things like Ohm's law, Kirchhoff's law. And they said that the current, which would be the capacitance times the rate of change of voltage, is just equal to the sum of all of these um, different um, inputs, all of these different currents. So you've got your current from our sodium ions, we've got a current from our potassium ions, and then they concluded that the um, calcium and chloride channels weren't, weren't that important, so they neglected them and said everything else can just be attributed to some sort of leak term. And importantly, these kind of, so you hear of M, cubed h and n to the power of four. These correspond to the probability of our channels to be open given a certain voltage. So if the cell is at a particular voltage level, then say the potassium channel has a 50% chance of being open. So if we have lots of these potassium channels along our uh, synapse, then 50% of them are going to be open. And that's um, how these um, that's what these terms correspond to. And they have their own dynamics that depend on the voltage of the cell at a given time. And as part of this work, Hodgkin and Huxley um, recorded action potentials traveling along a squid giant axon. And that way they were able to fit these um, functions. So of, of how likely our ion channels are being are to be open and closed and they were able to come up with this model that um, ultimately won them the Nobel Prize for Physiology and Medicine in 1963. And this is regarded as one of the greatest achievements in 20th century biophysics. So it was really beneficial in understanding how action potentials are generated and how neurons communicate. However, it describes a single neuron in a network of 100 billion neurons. So if we want to think about you know, the neural activity from the brain at large, it's not going to be a particularly useful model. And typically when we are recording um, electrical activity from the brain, we're looking at the whole brain. So this guy on the left here is having um, his neural activity recorded. They put electrodes onto a subject's scalp and they record the average activity of the neurons underneath that are at that point. And this is typically looking at the average activity of hundreds of thousands of neurons. So it would be impractical here to be using something like the Hodgkin Huxley model, as we'd have four equations um, for each neuron. So, you know, we'd have. 400,000 uh, different equations and we wouldn't really be able to gain much insight into that system through analysis. 
And then just to mention on the right here, this is typically the type of thing that we see um, when we put an electrode on the scalp. So if you put um, something here to measure the electrical activity, you'll see um, different kind of um, waves um, or different oscillations at different frequencies. And depending on what you're doing, the frequency of those oscillations will be different. So the more you're doing, the more active you are, the higher the frequency of the oscillations. So that would be your aroused state. Once you start to relax, the activity slows down. And once you're in a state of deep, deep sleep, you have um, slow, um, slow oscillations um, when you record at scalp level. Okay. So with that, some um, Wilson and Cowan um, in the 1970s wanted to develop a model that was tractable and could be easily analysed to understand how groups of neurons behave collectively. And so we said that a neuron is, it releases an action potential when its voltage increases past a certain value. So it's just a threshold element. When your voltage reaches a threshold, an action potential is released and your voltage is reset to baseline. So if we were to average over um, noise or heterogeneity in a network of threshold elements, we'd get that the firing rate, so the rate at which the elements um, reach threshold, um, the average or the proportion of cells reaching threshold has a sigmoidal shape. So if there's not much activity, none of our um, oscillators or our threshold units are going to be reaching threshold. While if there's high activity in our network, then most of your threshold units are going to be reaching threshold. So that's your firing rate function that will describe um, how active um, your network is, how much activity is being sent out. So an action potential is sent out to the other cells in your network. So if we have a high firing rate, it means lots of action potentials are being released and that's going to then trigger more neurons to fire and we'll have high activity. And Wilson and Cowan proposed a model of two um, populations of neurons. They had a population of excitatory neurons and a population of inhibitory neurons. So an excitatory neuron, as the name suggests, excites those around it. So it pushes them closer to threshold. And then an inhibitory neuron does the opposite it's going to reduce the voltage of the other neurons and make them less likely to reach threshold. So these two populations are going to be coupled together and their firing rates are going to impact the firing rates of each other and themselves. And the next component of the model is the synaptic response function. So remember I said that an action potential opens up these ion channels and then ions flow in and out of the cell. So it's not an instantaneous process. When the action potential arrives, it takes some time for the ion channels to open and for current to flow into the cell. So the synaptic response kind of models that response. There's some increase and then your um, activity is going to decay. So putting this all together, we get a set of equations, differential equations, where Q is a differential operator, which is just the Green's function of our synaptic response. So our operator, differential operator, when it acts on our synaptic response, we just get a delta pulse. So that's like our action potential. So here then we have the activity of our excitatory population. Um, is um, given as follows. So the activity is driven by the firing rate and the firing rate um, is a function of the inputs to that population. So you have the input from itself, so an excitatory um, loop, so it's going to excite itself and then it has an input from the inhibitory population. So this WEI is going to be negative, it's going to be making it less likely um, to fire, to be active, and then we have an external input. 
and we have a similar equation for i. So that's the wilson cowan model and it, it was quite useful in terms of um, describing different neural phenomena but it's somewhat simplistic and a better model is the janssen rick model which just extends to three populations where we separate the excitatory um, cells into two separate cis or two separate populations that have slightly different dynamics. All the rest is kind of the same, but the key is that this model has a rich set of dynamics. So if we perform a um, bifurcation analysis and continue in one of our parameters, we get a bifurcation diagram like this. So here we're continuing in the um, input to our excitatory cells. And you can see for negative input, we just have one fixed point. As A is increased, we have three fixed points. And then again, at a certain point, we have one fixed point. So the red is a stable um, fixed point. Black is an unstable fixed point. And then the blue and green correspond to oscillations. So it's the max and min of our oscillation, blue are unstable oscillations and green are stable oscillations. And one of the interesting things about this model is that it has coexisting limit cycles. So here you can see here to here we've got a high amplitude oscillation and then here to here we have a low amplitude oscillation. Which means that this model has been used to understand epilepsy. So epilepsy is a neurological disorder where we have where we have transitions to high amplitude oscillations known as seizures. So a seizure, you have high amplitude, high frequency activity. So you could view a transition to a seizure as a transition from your low amplitude oscillations to your high amplitude oscillations. So that's one possible application for this model. It's not what I'm going to focus on here. What I'm going to focus on is building this model up into something, a whole brain um, network. So you can think of one of these um, groups of cells, so one Janssen unit, so one of these three population models, as being a small area of cortex. So it's a small area of your brain. And then if we add in a second one, we're just looking at two brain areas and seeing how that how they interact. And if and they're both synchronized, so they could both be doing the same thing. Um, or perhaps they desynchronize and they're doing different things. Or maybe one stops oscillating and the, one the other one takes over. So these are the type of things that you can examine and you can build up larger networks of more and more of these brain areas or units. And when you do that, you can see things that look kind of similar to those voltage traces I showed you um, from the electrical recordings from people's scalps. You can see that we have some nice oscillations and they're quite irregular and at different times different areas are more dominant than others. Okay and one thing that people have been trying to do is combine a realistic structural connectivity matrix. So these are things that can be um, produced by scanning someone's brain. You can look at how connected different areas are and come up with a connectivity matrix that says, you know, this part of the brain is connected to this part of the brain, but it's not connected to that piece at the back. And you can build up these networks and then combine our model. So you take one of these Janssen Rick units and put it at each brain location and connect them according to that realistic connectivity matrix. And then you can ask questions like, does that structural connectivity explain the functional connectivity that emerges? So does it explain why this part of the brain is synchronized with this part of the brain or that it's not synchronized with another part of the brain? And those are the type of questions that people typically ask when studying these models. And this allows people to understand why certain structural connections are important and why perhaps in a disease when one of those connections is broken, why it has such detrimental 
results to the function of the network and how well that person is able to um, go about their daily business. Okay, but another approach when considering the whole brain is to use a spatially extended mean field model rather than kind of connecting up lots of these different units we could just consider a tissue like a neuro piece of neural tissue as a spatially extended system the model is more or less the same the only difference is that we have a um, spatial coupling kernel now that describes how strongly connected cells are depending on how far apart they are okay and you may have heard this phrase assume a spherical cow well we're assuming a spherical brain to start with which isn't actually as ridiculous as it sounds so the cortex of so the human brain cortex is heavily folded so it has lots of these kind of crevices and dips and um, like here so you can think about this as like a deflated football or a deflated balloon you have lots of wrinkles in it and then once you kind of pump air into it it will regain its spherical shape and similarly if you were to say pump air into the brain um, which you wouldn't obviously do but the same idea if you were to expand out all of these crevices or um, as they're called gyrus then you get a nice sphere so we can simulate and analyze the brain on a sphere and then fold it back down and see how that activity looks on our folded surface so i'm just gonna play that movie again so when we simulate our neural field equation so this spatially extended model on a sphere we can get nice patterns these types of things and remembering back to um, you know, any introductory courses you took on oscillations and waves all of our solutions our patterns can be represented as a linear combination of our normal mode solutions so in the middle here I'm just showing lots of different normal mode solutions and each of these patterns can just be represented as a linear combination of those normal modes so these types of networks um, or these type of systems can be analyzed using things like symmetric bifurcation theory and normal form analysis and then we can ask questions like which normal modes are significant in different scenarios and which are there any particular patterns that are seen in diseases and maybe why would we see that pattern in one disease um, and not the other or a particular pattern might see in a healthy individual that we wouldn't see in someone who has a disease And on the next slide, I have a um, movie which uh, was made by Ingo Boa, who used forward modeling to match the underlying activity on the cortex to that seen on the surface of your brain when you measure it. So on the left here, we have the activity that was recorded, say, from electrodes on the cortex. And in the middle, we have what the model tells us is the behavior underneath the surface on the surface of your cortex. So it tells you how this kind of net activity at the cortex level maps to scalp level recordings. And it's, it's very accurate, it works well. But what we're really seeing here is phenomenological. We just made a model to describe or understand what we're seeing we've paid very little attention to the underlying network so i've kind of talked about two main models these single neuron level models that can't be used to describe much more than a handful of cells and then these whole brain models that can explain what we're seeing or can reproduce what we're seeing but maybe not explain why we're seeing it so something's missing and this is what i work on and will spend the remainder of my talk discussing 
These mean field models that I was discussing, they're built on the assumption that the neurons fire asynchronously. But many of our, the, many of the neural phenomena that are important and play a role in certain diseases are a result of neurons synchronizing and desynchronizing. So the dynamics of the underlying spiking network are important and we must consider them. So here is a, what we call a raster plot on the left. So the dots are spike times. So that's when our neuron releases an action potential, when it reaches threshold and releases an action potential. So we've got um, a line for each of the neurons, 100 neurons in our network, and we're looking at a span of a second. And you can see that there's these kind of events where lots of the neurons fire at the same time. So they're synchronizing their activity. And on the right here, we have the average fire rate. So this would be similar to that, um, what we would um, study in the mean field models. We look at firing rates, but that's the only thing we're able to track in those models. And we really want to also be able to track something like synchrony. So how synchronized are the neurons? And you can see that it's not constant, so it wouldn't be right to neglect it. It's changing over time. So it's a dynamic variable that we want to be able to track at the kind of um, mean field level when we're looking at average, pop or average population dynamics. But to do this, we need to go back to thinking about single neurons. So I'm not going to use the hodgkin hoxie model. I'm going to use something a little simpler. So it's a simple um, threshold, mo threshold model. It's a quadratic integrating fire. Um, we have our voltage evolving quadratically um, and once it reaches a certain threshold it's reset and um, well, that should be at equals. Once it reaches a threshold it's reset to a lower value and if our input here which is eta is positive we're going to get regular spiking. So the voltage increases it gets to its thre threshold value and then it's reset down to its reset value. And in this case, the um, rate at which we fire, so the rate at which action potentials are released, the rate we reach threshold, is proportional to the square root of our drive eta. So we'll have the frequency is, um, has the shape of square root of eta. We want to consider a network of these neurons. So we introduce an index and we have a coupling current I, which is going to describe how the neurons receive those action potentials. So how do the, um, when one neuron sends an action potential out through its axon, how does that affect the voltage of the other neurons? And this is the form of our coupling current, which is a similar form to that of Hodgkin and Huxley. And we have a conductance, now it's time dependent, and we have um, a reversal potential. So just, this just means that with our um, ion channels, they have a reversal potential associated with them. So if voltage is above a certain value, then the ions flow into the cell. If it's below that value, they'll flow in the opposite direction. So that's the idea there. And then our conductance, conductance um, evolves according to the following differential equation, where again, Q is just that Green's function for our synaptic response. And on the right, we have a sum of delta functions. So here, capital T, J, S is a spike time. So that's when our neuron releases an action potential. The time at which the voltage reaches a threshold value, that's this time here. So every time our time is equal to a time at which we reach threshold, this is equal to one, otherwise it's equal to zero. So we're just summing up over all of our spike times and that's, um, how our, that's our conductance and it has a dip, we have our differential operator Q acting on that. So if we simulate this network, we can get some you know, spiking dynamics and these kind of synchronized bursts where um, a lot of the neurons fire around the same time.
But in order to apply a um, term, uh, the mean field limit, so take the number of oscillators to infinity, it's easier to work in terms of phase. So these are regular spiking cells. They have a frequency associated with them. So they also have a phase associated with them. So instead of talking about the kind of voltage itself, we're going to talk about the phase of the oscillation. So for example, if we're here, then our phase is 0 0.5. We're halfway, well, sorry, we're talking about phase in terms of minus pi to pi. So our phase will be zero if we were here. Our phase will be pi if we're up here. And we're gonna think about things in that um, regard instead of the, the, um, the voltages themselves. And once we're in a phase framework, we can say that our phases evolve according to, so we have our natural frequency. So what's the frequency that our um, oscillator would um, evolve at in isolation on its own, what's its natural frequency, plus the phase response curve times its input. So the phase response curve just tells us how the um, oscillator reacts to an input given the current phase of its oscillation. So if it's um, you know, close to threshold and it's perturbed, it's going to have um, a different effect to when it's say down here and it's given a perturbation. So that's your phase response curve. And then the other thing is that our delta function for when we're looking, summing over our different spike times, well now we know that spike times happen when our phase is equal to pi. So we can convert that delta function to one in terms of phase we just have then the differential of our phase with respect to t at, that at the time it reaches threshold. So. so now we just have a network of coupled phase oscillators, which is amenable to the large n limit. If we let rho um, be our, pause that, let rho be our density, so then rho times d theta will be the fraction of oscillators with phase between theta and theta plus d theta, natural frequency eta naught or eta at time t. Then for oscillators of the form given by our quadratic integrating fire model, they can be represented um, in the following form. So when we take and we write our density in Fourier form, the Fourier coefficients are just a power series. So here, each of our Fourier coefficients is just some function a to the power of n. Um, and this was proven by uh, an Antonsen in 2008, and it applies to all networks of coupled oscillators in which the phase response curve is sinusoidal. So that's the key here. You need your phase response curve to be sinusoidal, and if it is, then and um, your density is going to have the following form. And then we can use our continuity equation to describe how that density evolves. And then the last thing we want to say is, we'll be thinking in terms of our order parameter, which is just the average of all of our oscillators. So imagine we have our oscillators moving around and their phase is just changing. And this is kind of a unit disk. The current order, current order order parameter is the center of mass of all of these dots as they move around. If the dots are clumped together, then your current motor order parameter is going to be close to the edge of the disk and have a phase equal to the average phase of all of those oscillators. If they're asynchronous, all the phases are different, then your dot's going to be in the center and you're going to be um, asynchronous. So you say, when we're in a situation like this, we're highly synchronized. And when we're in a situation like this, we're asynchronous. So the length of the vector from the middle of your circle to your dot is your, how synchronous you are. And then the angle is just the average phase of all of your oscillators. And if you put all of this together, we get our next generation neural model which takes a similar form to the Wilson-Cannon model, 
we still have a differential operator acting on something. So here are conductance. And it's equal to a firing rate. But previously inside, our firing rate would have just been a function of G, but now it's a function of Z, which is our Kerr motor order parameter. And it's a real valued function of a complex number. So if we were to look at our firing rate as a function of our order parameter, we can see that it would look like this. So we have high firing when we're close to our angle. So remember we said firing occurs, so we have spikes when our angle crosses through, a phase crosses through pi. So that would be when we cross through this point and our firing rate is going to be highest if all of the neurons pass through pi at all, they all fire at the same time. So that would be at the very edge of the disc here. And then we have low firing around the edge of the disc elsewhere. And then Z has its own dynamics. So it's uh, now a dynamic variable, whereas previously um, in the other models, we would have had that synchrony was just constant. And comparing the mean field reduced um, equation to our network of spiking neurons. So if we were to simulate that network of quadratic integrating fire neurons and calculate our synchrony, that would be the red trace here. And the blue trace is that um, that's given by these equations here. So you can see it's a very good match. And similarly, if you look at G and its derivative, there is some finite size effects, but the quantitative behavior is similar. So rather than simulating you know, thousands of equations, we can simulate this fourth order differential equation. So we've got complex numbers, so we have two, two equations there, and then Q is a second order differential operator, so that means we have a fourth order um, ODE. And then if we were to do a bifurcation analysis, <coughs> We can find a hot firefication, so we can have oscillations. Below the curve here, we have oscillations. We see more interesting dynamics when we look at two populations. So if we have two populations that just talk to each other, but not back to themselves, we again just have a hot firefication. We see this type of behavior. Once we introduce um, self coupling, so it's they're now talking to themselves, we get a very inter a more interesting bifurcation diagram. So here we've got a fixed point, we have a hot bifurcation, we've got some period doubling bifurcations, we've got these isolas, some torus bifurcations, and you can see there's a wide range of parameters for which we have oscillations. And again, like the janssen rit model, we have these coexisting limit cycles. So we have a low amplitude oscillation here, and a high amplitude oscillation here for the same value for the same value here of our external drive. So with that, I just will talk about two um, applications. So the first um, is for epilepsy. So again, we said coexisting limit cycles can be uh, used to study epilepsy. We have say one limit cycle where we have low um, amplitude um, oscillations. These are like healthy oscillations. And then we have another um, limit cycle where we have our pathological or seizure-like activity. So this would be like a seizure. It's a burst of high frequency activity. And we can perturb our system in the healthy regime. And we'll see that it transitions to seizure behavior. So then we'd want to investigate the basin subtraction of both of these states to see can we perturb our system back into the healthy state. And that would help us develop drugs to treat seizures so that we could say, well, it's this um, connection that's important. It's this type of um, neurotransmitter that you need to give the system and then it will transition back to healthy behavior. So this one is work in progress. Um, we've got the kind of, we've been able to model a seizure, but not yet terminate the seizure. The other um, one I was gonna talk to you about is beta rebound. So this um, is a phenomenon that occurs 
um, when we move. So your motor cortex, so it's the part of your brain that's responsible for movement, it's just along the top here. When you're not moving, if you're sitting still and you put electrodes along there, you'll see um, oscillations at beta frequency, which is between 13 and 30 hertz. Then if you move, the network desynchronizes and all the neurons start doing different things. And um, so you no longer have that nice smooth oscillation, you have something somewhat more random. Then once you stop moving, in order to reinstate that beta frequency, there's a moment of high synchrony before the um, power goes back to its original level. So if you were to look at a power spectrum, you'd see a reduction in frequency at the beta band level, and then you see an increase in that um, activity before it goes back down to the normal level. And this is an important thing to study because in um, schizophrenia, they don't get that rebound uh, to the same extent. So schizophrenia patients, they have a desynchronization and a reduction in power, but once they stop moving, you don't see that strong um, increase in power before settling back down to normal. So if we then look at our model and set the system up so that it's oscillating at beta frequency, and we give it an input, which we say is you know, someone moving, so that's the red, and then we turn off the input, and all we've done is turn off the input. So the system should be back to the scenario was when we started. What we find is that in order to get back to the behavior had before, the network needs to resynchronize. So it comes, goes to a stage where it's heavily synchronized. So the edge of the disk is when the neurons are very synchronized. And then once it's in that highly synchronized regime, it can reduce its level of synchrony and go back to how it was behaving before. And if we look at a spectrogram of our current, so the synaptic current is the thing we'd be measuring um, in these examples here from the actual recordings, you can see that you have some frequency. The oscillations are at 15 hertz, then there's no oscillations at 15 hertz, and then we have higher power in the, that, for those oscillations, so they're higher amplitude before they settle back down to the original level, which matches up with the healthy controls. And we were able to show that if we change the time scale of our synaptic response, so remember I said um, that synaptic processing, so it takes some time for the channels to open and allow ions to flow in and out, if we lengthen that time scale, so the amount of time it takes for those channels to open and close, we no longer see a rebound. So that would lead us to believe that in schizophrenia, there is a slowing of that synaptic processing, which could be the reason behind not seeing that rebound and could also be the reason behind other symptoms associated with schizophrenia. So that's um, me done, just a quick summary. So the brain is an electrical circuit, so studying it is just like studying um, electrical circuits um, with all the same rules that apply in physics. And we can model it as a network of coupled oscillators. Then I said that the underlying network dynamics should not be neglected. Um, and in my work, I draw inspiration from the physics of self-organized systems to derive this new low dimensional neural model and then the model is able to link fire and rate to within population synchrony and there's lots of interesting applications to be explored so we're only at the start of that now so i'd just like to thank some of the amazing people i've had a, a pleasure of working with over the um, last few years so many of them at nottingham a couple at um the, at NYU and NGIT, and then I'm, of course, now in UCD. So these people here, um, this is Steve Coombs, John Renzel, Ahmed Bose, Danielle Avitvile, Matthew Brooks, Rachel Nix, James Ross, Ruben O'Dee, and Michael Forrester. 
So if you have any questions um, after the talk, my email is anya.burn at ucd.ie and that's my um, email address, or sorry, my web address there. So thank you very much for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Onya, thank you so much for this very nice talk, very stimulating talk, very nice subject. So once again, as before, please, if you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand on the chat, on the, uh, on the Zoom application, or write your questions on the chat, and uh, we can read them uh, for you if you don't want to appear or be, shown, be seen, okay, or be heard. Right, so while people think about their questions, I have a very uh, uh, simple, naive question. When you said about, when you, when you discuss the, uh, the spatial uh, model, um, uh, can, you, can you talk a bit more about that? So is it, uh, you define a spatial domain with a coordinate X and Y, say, and then for each point, you allocate one neuron, that is one ODE that you have to solve, and then with that spatial operator, you average, the results for every point on your x y plane say is that how it works can you say a bit more about that yeah so it's yeah it would be kind of assuming that we have we more so assuming we have one of these neural masses so say the wilson count or the jansen rick assuming that at every point along our cortex we have one of those and then we're just averaging over space and um, but historically the those type of models aren't you know they're not exact derivations it's more of a case of this is the um type of spatial model we would expect to have um whereas more recently with the type of work that i was explaining towards the end mm -hmm. it has been possible to derive you know exact um spatially extended models so now we're thinking single neuron and it has a spatial coordinate and a time um, associated with it and then we can average over space um, and get a exact a more um, continuum approach yeah mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i see i see and how many uh, uh so so in this in this case um uh, a standard simulation how many neurons would you be considering and uh, how long would a simulation take um so if we were uh, working in the kind of network of lots of coupled neurons, you'd want to be considering, you know, uh, 100,000 neurons in order to have kind of a realistic wow. scenario. So it, it's a really computationally expensive task, which is why we want to develop these mean field approaches yes. where you only have to simulate, you know, a handful of equations and you get most of the dynamics that you, you want and mm. need to understand. Excellent. Okay, so we have a question. I think Andrea has raised her has raised her hand. Can you go ahead, Andrea? Oh, hi, Anya. Thank you for the talk. Thank you very much for starting with baby steps yes. for non-neural maths people. Um, so I have a question. You had a slide. I just want to see it because my internet was flashing here. Um, so it said something about large n um, at the very top. That the title was for large n. So I just want to know what the N was, because <laughs> it yeah. decided to fail right where you... This one here. Um, so I uh, love it, a large N. So. Yeah, I possibly didn't even say it now that you highlight it. Um, N is the number of oscillators um, mm. that we have ah, in your okay. network. So the number of neurons. Yes. Um, so we're assuming a large number of neurons. Because mm. you know me, I see a large N and think asymptotics, but yes. okay, so this is not, okay. Well, this um, is going towards a continuum limit, right? So Yeah, yeah so yeah. in a way. Yeah. Okay, cool, interesting. Um, can you explain also the theta again? Um, I didn't really see the graph with the theta. So the it's theta is measuring what exactly? It's just the phase of our oscillation. So if we have something that, you know, it, it repeats itself, Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Then you can you can just explain it in terms of a phase. So in, and you can say that say here the when your voltage is I don't know here is maybe about five, then your phase is your phase is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this, and when your voltage is this, your phase is this. And in terms mm -hmm. of the maths, it's a lot easier to 
apply that mm -hmm. continuum limit to a network of phase coupled oscillators rather than these kind of mm -hmm. this idea where here you know we have these undefined spike times we're just mm -hmm. saying when we reach threshold we have a spike whereas in the phase system we know that when mm -hmm. the phase is pi then we have an event then we've reached mm -hmm. threshold so it's a defined mm -hmm. event not just when we come across this time we're going to have an event and it makes and then sense. yeah that makes sense uh, the threshold does it come from the system or do you already know the threshold Yes, yeah, so you define so the threshold. It comes from the simulation. You need yes. to find it. Okay. When the voltage reaches this threshold value, we're said to have an event and we reset. Mm -hmm. So it's not something like you set a threshold, you're obtaining the threshold from the system, from the modeling. No, so you, yeah, you just set it at the okay. start and it, you've set up something realistic that you know when a neuron's voltage crosses a certain value, that's usually when it um, releases mm -hmm. the natural potential. So you're saying this comes from the biology? Yeah. So it's, it's oh, interesting. So it is kind of translatable from the biology to the maths and math biology. Yeah. Oh, that's really cool. Thank you very much. That was really interesting. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So let me check whether we have more raised hands or questions here on the chat. No, we don't have. Uh, can I ask you one more question, Onya? So yeah, okay. just uh, on the slide before that, you ha you, ma you modeled your activity using this quadratic uh, yeah. uh, formula. So the spikes that you get, they are singularities on the solution of V, right? Yeah. So is it worrying that you can integrate the numerics, how you integrate the singularity if it's accurate, accurately uh, described, they might not be integrable, right? You can, you can explode something eventually. Yeah, so I think the reason for choosing the quadratic integrate and fire as well, that it reaches, you know, it um, diverges to infinity in finite time. Yeah, that's right. So mm. That's the, so that therefore you can cut off kind of early, you can say threshold is at 100, and the time it would actually take you to get to infinity is minuscule, so it can yes. be neglected. And something that oh, I kind I of see, I see. brushed, something I brushed over is that the, in the phase representation, you're actually just looking at the tangent, like the tan func tan function, which is equivalent. So if you say yeah. that your voltage is equal to tan theta over two, mm -hmm. then it's, it's totally equivalent if your thresholds are plus and minus infinity because that shape oh, of a quadratic evolution is just a, you know, a inverse tan function. Yes, 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 yes. I see, I see. And then uh, th that's also a simple, naive question. You, you showed us the operator Q a few times and it has one plus one upon alpha, the second derivative of time or something. So what is the physical motivation or the biological motivation behind that operator? Um, so I'll just go back to one of these slides where I have it. Um, uh, oh, yeah, <laughs> I went too far. There we go. So the because was a physical. Um, we get this synaptic response curve as a physical, a bio, like that's something biophysical. That if you um, have a neuron and you give it a brief impulse, so an action potential, which we could mathematically say is just a a delta spike, mm -hmm. delta function, just a instantaneous short pulse, then the response that we would see in the cell in terms of its, you know, voltage or activity increase and then decrease takes this shape mm -hmm. um, where it gradually rises and then decays exponentially. Decays. Mm -hmm. And this is just, the operator is just the Green's function of that, um, shape so if you were to apply this operator to that shape we get a delta function i see in the same way that instead of writing say q e equals f we could have just said e is equal to the integral over time of s times f times f mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's kind of it's you could have had a convolution between this shape yep, yep. and the firing rate or you can say use your differential operator um, and that's equal to the firing rate. I see, I see, I see. 
Okay, very nice. So let me see if we have questions on the chat or people are raising hands. Uh, not yet, so I, I will allow myself one more question, just again for curiosity. On your bifurcation diagrams, there was one point at which you showed that there was a hop bifurcation, but the diagram looked very much like a pitchfork bifurcation. So oh, um, can you, can you not this ones, the, the, yeah. the other ones. So these are the gents, uh, can you go further? It's to, more towards the end. Yeah, it just takes a while for it to go through the slides. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. They're a bit large. <laughs> um, yeah, I know the one you're talking about. Okay, yeah. Um, this one. Yes, yes. Yes, so it's possibly just that I didn't, I should have maybe colored it differently, but this is we have, um, you know, a steady state and then we have a hop. That's the unstable steady state, and this is the maximum of our oscillations, and that's the minimum. Ah, I see, I see, I see. <laughs> yeah, they're just they're the lines are dashed, but possibly uh, not dashed enough that they look different from these lines. I, I noticed that they were dashed, and I, I thought that you were saying that these dash they correspond to limit cycles, but then I saw this pitchfork look, and I said, mm, that's interesting, and, I, and they're very nonlinear, so they're not symmetrical or anything. So, so that's why I was I was wondering whether they were pitchfork like or no no but now it makes sense i see i see very good very good so um any more questions any more suggestions uh, ideas uh doubts okay so onya thank you so much once again for your presentation your talk thank you so much for accepting our invitation it was very kind of you uh if you want to say a few words before we shut everybody of, uh, by the way, would you like uh, uh, to take a picture? Let's all, if you don't mind, switch on our cameras and I'll take a screenshot for further um, for a, a reference uh, later. Okay, so I'll do it. Drag is there. Okay. One, two, three, and very good. So it's a uh, it's all set here for, for posteriority. Aine, Onya, thank you once again for your, You're very for your welcome. talk. Thanks for having me. Okay, Draga, once again, thank you very much for your talk. It was very nice having you here. Thank you, thank you the audience, for uh, staying with us. So uh, uh, now we're going to have a lunch break. Then we're going to have another uh, a plenary talk. I think it's on computer, mathematics of computation, I think, logic. And then we are going to have another mechanics session at 4 p.m., okay? And we are having Aline talking about chaos uh, in pendular systems. And we are going to have Sarah talking about the rheology of uh, dense suspensions. So thank you once again. It was very nice having you. All the best. Take care. And I hope to see you at another point. Bye-bye.